Okay, in this lesson, I'd like to cover uh, a couple more technical, maybe kind of annoying things that you have to deal with with limits. Some things that you have to understand. Uh, so, let's begin with the idea of right-handed limits and left-handed limits. This is going to come up a lot uh, in your textbook with uh, limits practice questions. And then there's some later uh, issues you'll have to deal with to, um, like later in your textbook, uh, textbook authors and AP really like to drill this concept in, so you want to make sure you understand it. So, if you remember from before, if we have, whoops, I changed the color, if we have a graph, I'll make it a little more interesting this time, if we have some squiggly graph like this and we say that some point on here doesn't exist uh, let's see how do I do this okay if we that if we say that some point on here doesn't exist and that we have a little open point there that well, how the basic idea of limits is we look at, okay, what what is the left side leading up to? Like, it doesn't matter what's going on here. We just look as it gets closer and closer and look really close, and it's just, it's touching it right there. Then from the right side, we, we move along, and it gets closer and closer and closer and comes right up on the exact same point. So this is the limit in this function. But we can get some weirder functions where... Your teacher might say, okay, well, let's have a function like this, a real-world example where oh, something's changing, then all of a sudden one day it changes again, hops up, and then keeps on going. Uh, one of these should be an open point. So it moves along here, and then, boom, point's empty, and the, where the function goes, it hops right up here. Now, these are called piecewise functions, and... Um, they're called functions because all a function needs is to pass the vertical line test, meaning that if you pick any x value, it'll have only one y value. So if we pick this x value over here, that's not a y value there, that's empty. Our y value is up here. And so that in the eyes of x, if you plug in any value along this axis, you're going to get something over, uh, up in the y section. So what we know is that it's um, the function uh, works along the entire domain or at least the one I've given you here from here to here but what we have to deal with is now we have two different limits we have the right sided limit and the left sided limit now if we go from the left side along here we're going to hit one point specifically right there even though it's empty we still have a limit here from the left side but if we go from the right side we're going to end up up here so now that you understand the basic idea of limits I'm going to pause and get an example okay so what I've done is just draw this equation out here uh, this is what a piecewise function looks like over here is um, well, I'll just draw it out. So, what this is telling us is when x is less than 0, when we draw out our graph, that if we give it an x value, we match it up here. If it's less than 0, then it goes here and gets squared. So the back half of our function is going to be x squared like that. And then there's an open point there, because when it's less than 0, not less than or equal to 0, now when it's greater than or equal to zero, it's going to be at one, and it's just going to be a horizontal line like that. Now, here's where we run into the concept of left side or right side limits, and this is going to be an easy example for you to solve. Now, the only clear area where the left-handed limit and the right-handed limit are different is on the 
x or on the y axis here, sorry. Um, at x equals zero. And so we're gonna run into some notation here. So we're gonna say the limit as x equal or as x goes to zero from the positive side, from the right side for this function. Um, I'm just going to call it f of x. And then coming from the left side, coming from the negative side, we have the limit as x approaches 0 from that negative side. So the limit is going to be two different values. As it approaches from the positive side, from here it goes to 1. And then it, as it comes from the negative side, we go on the negative side here, and as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, boom, we hit zero. Now, this should be really obvious just from looking at the graph. And once you see that, that's really all there is to left side and right sided limits. Your teacher or your textbook is not going to give you a question that's any harder than this. All it takes is looking at it and understanding what is meant by left hand limit and a right hand limit. Once you get that concept, then um, all you have to do is just use your understanding of it and just look at the graph, read it. You might have to plug a value in here, but that's all you have to do. And so, now that we have that over with, uh, I'm going to take a little time to do the sandwich theorem. Um, this is kind of a funny thing. Let me just clean this up. Okay, the sandwich theorem... All that says is, and again, um, just like left-handed and right-handed limits, you might have to do some exercises with this, but what's really important is that you understand what's going on, and it doesn't really matter that you know exactly how to do it, just so much that you could maybe see what um, someone's getting at, or see how you could use it as a tool. Now, the sandwich theorem, what this says is, if we have some crazy function like this, like our crazy function we were talking about before, and we say we want the limit right here, if we say whether it's an open clo or closed point, it doesn't matter, we just want to say where these sides lead up to, we say what is the limit here? Now, what it actually is beyond the scope of this explanation. We don't we don't know what this is. But the sandwich theorem says that if we have any other function at the top that it does whatever it wants to, that comes down and touches right here. And then we have uh, another one from the bottom come through and touch it right there. then what we say is that if this function is, if we say that this bottom function is always less than or equal to this middle function, and this upper function is always greater than or equal to, so there's always this empty space between these parts here, if this upper one is always greater than or equal to this middle function, then they sandwich this middle function in. This middle one is always between the two. Now, if this is always between the two and these two touch at the point where we want to find the limit, then the middle function has to have the same limit as the upper and lower one. Now, you might be thinking this is really obvious and why would um, you have to know this, but it's just your it's just the calculus teachers, just the AP checking that you understand that this reasoning that if two things are sandwiching another thing between them and you have one point matching, then this is forced to go squeeze right through at a single point and that's going to be our limit. 
Now, this is useful when you know for a fact what your upper and lower functions are, and you can show that this is the case, that this is always between them. But if you understand this, that's your sandwich theorem in a nutshell, and um, I wouldn't bother uh, understanding it any more than that. It's a really simple concept, and if you get this, any questions you get in your textbook about it, any practice problems you have to do will make sense, because you just follow your understanding of it, and you shouldn't have any trouble. But leave a comment or let me know if you need an explanation on a specific question, or you want me to go back and uh, make something more clear. Alright, thanks for watching, and I'll be back in the next video.